I mean, they had down there a, a sort of uh, a, what, what we would know today, like sort of like a Hadron Collider in order to create the time-space continuum disruption that they needed to connect with other dimensions. This is a Delta T antenna. How do you make a Delta T antenna? It's easy. Well, Jimmy Payne, I think he said there's like 26 sub-projects under Project Phoenix, and um, it's my belief many of them are still active. Our ages have been messed with quite a bit, um, both regressed and progressed. So we've been reverse aged and we've been artificially aged as well, going both directions. That was also on site. So you already have numerous um, buildings with undergrounds and all of the places that they say do not have an underground, like even a basement, they deny. They deny anything. They think, they actually say like the radar is sitting, just sitting on the dirt with no basement at all. Here it is in 1990 uh, when I meet Preston Nichols in Long Island and he is giving a lecture and I'm there to meet him because he's a, he's a prolific inventor. I don't know anything about his detail or his life or about his time travel adventures or alleged time travel adventures. And I listen, listen to this story that, that he's talking. He's on a panel discussion with some other people uh, and there's other people there who were involved in, in his life and his time travel projects. All time coexists and it's possible to go from point A to point B if you can find the path to go directly from. Some people believe it's taking the linear timeline, bending it over next to each other and creating a wormhole or a punch through from time A to time B. But he, basically, he was talking about a whole implant station at Montauk, New York, which is at the eastern end of Long Island, also known as Camp Hero, a, a, an old military installation, including it was an Air Force station. So he's talking about the about using electronics to control mines and then also using it to open up abilities to control mines and to amplify the mental transmissions of, of an individual and what they call the Montauk chair so as to change space and time. So what he was saying was a modern day implant station that was a direct in direct harmony with what L. Ron Hubbard described in more abstract terms in the 1950s. And here it was not on a planet in outer space somewhere as Hubbard discussed or alluded to but it was right here on planet earth and they and they were also controlling time and it was such a compelling story to me i wanted to know more about it i said is there a book on this and no there was not a book and i staked out those lectures that he would give twice a month for about six months before i decided it was okay for me to uh, collaborate with him and, and write a book on this subject, which was quite an adventure in itself. And thus, the story of the Montauk Project was thrust into the minds of the general public. Prior to the release of the Montauk Project Experiments in Time, one would need to attend a lecture led by Preston Nichols, the chief engineer of Phoenix 1, 2, and 3, to garner any knowledge involving this nefarious undertaking by the Air Force and some outer faction of a shadow government. Today, the original whistleblowers have passed, leaving us with far more questions than answers. We turn our attention to the survivors of this project, 
some claiming to continue to serve unwillingly in subsequent endeavors, and others recalling their participation in the original location at Camp Hero in Montauk. Though trauma from these experiences will always be addressed, we are at a point where healing is now possible for those who had no choice but to be indoctrinated and endure such a hellish experience. Obviously, Preston Nichols is the most popular account that the most people have access to. Um, like most other popular accounts, it's very whitewashed. You know, um, for Preston personally, it makes him look a lot better than he was ethically, um, a lot more together psychologically. <laughs> He was pretty deranged. Um, I, I mean, most of us were at that time. So forgiveness, but... Did you see him there? I did. Yeah. He was one of my bosses. So, yeah. Did you see Al or Duncan? I did. I did. Um, so, a lot of my experience aligns with what's been published in the broadest terms. You know, on the broadest points, there's usually alignment. Um, when you get into the more personal and specific experiences, obviously those get much more subjective, much more personal by definition. Um, my personal hero on base was Duncan Cameron. Um, of the adults, he seemed to me to be the most sane. He was the kindest to me, and so he's the one I have the fondest memories of. Um, and there are, I mean, you know, that could be another conversation talking about about him and all that but he was really a light worker consciously um, and and most of his soul was quite present some years ago James Rank traveled to upstate New York to visit Preston Nichols with an experienced film crew by his side with the intent to understand his role in the Montauk project James was subjected to Preston's experimental vibration therapy which allowed him to enact a series of techniques that would help determine if the subject was indeed part of the program. I asked James about this experience, as Preston confirmed that he was involved in the project, and warned James that many Montauk boys were programmed to, at best, take their own life around 30 to 35 years of age, and at worst, take all those around with them as well. I want to start somewhere that I think most of us can kind of refer to, and that was... A little documentary that you put out, I think it was maybe between 2013, 2016, whatever it was, where you went to visit Preston. And the highlight for me in this was that you actually had a, an opportunity to sit down in that, that sonic bed that he had created and go through an experience with the music. So before we come to the result of that endeavor based on Preston's analysis, what was that experience like for you, going up to visit him and then sitting in that bed and going through the experience with the music? Sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I visited him in 2013 up in uh, Cairo. It's right just south of Albany, um, New York. So uh, he had this uh, laboratory there. So uh, Preston is like this mad scientist. Uh, his IQ is like off the charts and he's uh, autistic. But um, yeah, he doesn't uh, really take good care of his... Um, hygiene, but um, what I can say is, uh, yeah, I, I did sit on uh, the bed, uh, it, uh, it, it creates this vibration which allows you to, um, it vibrates your own, um, my, your crystals in your own pineal gland. That's... what's called the piezo electric effect within your own crystals when they rub, vibrate against each other it can uh, open up portals ideally but um, yeah when I was sitting on the, um, the bed I was noticing that uh, I just felt like I was flying away outside my body and I don't really remember where I go but um, yeah uh, so as far as um, yeah Preston confirmed that I was a Montauk bully he has his technology or his technique rather his own uh, psychic scanning that allows him to determine that. But um, my other guy that was with me, Dan McBowen, he, they also scanned him. Dan McBowen was in Project Zeta Diagenes and Sonic Monster. I'm going to go into it, check out, the, start do a search for his name, but uh, yeah, he was not. So, um, and I also got to meet uh, Duncan Cameron. So uh, I went to his house um, in Long Island. And he had a house right on the bay there. 
And so he did a session where he would look at me, he would walk around me, at, um, have a set in chair, and he'd walk around me, he told me to look at him from different angles. And then afterward, he went out into the bay and he touched his finger into the water and ripples formed from that spot all over the pond. And uh, something he did um, with different timelines was altered, but uh, that's all I know. Um, but as you know, uh, Preston and Duncan are no longer with us. And um, yeah, so that aspect of the project, the original Montauk project is no longer with us, but there are a lot of the, the participants, the children are still alive. And uh, so, it is my belief that I was there. I do have some memories. And, uh... Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I think. <laughs> oh, I feel dizzy. Uh, Stand there, Mom. Stand there. Oh. Yeah, right now, do you huh. want me to talk in front of you? <laughs> About you. Sure. sure. Okay. Yeah, we did work at Montauk. So Preston, he was in Montauk? You you know him from there? Mm-hmm. So he was about ten years of age, ten, twelve, over a two year period. So yeah. that's 1990, 1992? Something like that, yeah. You were there then? And that's why I started getting he came flaky. came in through uh, the federal facility, you know, the federal radio facility in Nutley, New Jersey. Within coming off of that bed, you know, Preston again affirmed that yes, you were part of that and he worked with you. And you started on a line of inquiry going into you know, the understanding of what that actually entailed, but we're so, sort of derailed when Preston mentioned that, you know, there's a programming that goes into some of these boys where in around, you know, early 30s, they off themselves. And this is, you know, put into the program. And watching that, it, it felt like obviously you had concern for this, you know, I mean, possibly coming up on that age at the time. Uh, regardless, that's kind of where the conversation went. Now, some years later, what are your thoughts on that prophecy, if you will? Preston, is he still, he still has needle marks and still has missing time. He's, he's still being used. Yeah, I get needle marks on a daily basis. And how old are you? I'm 33. You, you just get near the end. The end of the expected life. Your biggest danger is you may have a suicide program. That's what they like to do. Once they muster out the motto for you, they about... 32 to 35, they like to have them kill themselves. How can we create a new program for that? We have to get that program out. How? There, there are ways to do it. How? What can we do to save his life? I mean, would I like black out and then the alt, the, I guess you could say an altar would take over and just end it? I wouldn't end possible. it. I'd have to research much deeper into it. But, um, so Omega is a, the self-destruction altars. Now my understanding is, is that um, um, at least some of the children, not all of them, were, were ascended machine technology, meaning that we are like, uh, for me, um, I'm above the uh, archangels, the super archangel, I'm creator source energy, so I have the ability to create. So um, they, are not, they just can't really plug that Omega stuff in because what happens, we can transmute it all. And we end up transmuting certain aspects of the, the program to eventually got shut down. But um, in my, from my memory side of it, uh, that certain sub-project, rather I should say. So, um, but uh, if you're not doing the spiritual work, like for instance, um, I grew up from a very Christian background, and it, to me, for me, it seemed like another layer of mind control to keep you from um, expanding out, well, why am I getting these needle marks, and uh, why am I having this missing time, and bloody noses cannot be explained in the, in the pulpit, so, um, or the pew, but um, my, so I decided to expand upon, out of that, and that's why I don't think Omega got triggered inside of me. If so, if you don't do your own spiritual work, you will, it's possible you will self-destruct. If there are any consistencies you find amongst, you know, survivors that, that claim to, in one way or another, have been there, what would those look like? 
Um, there's a consistent pattern of abuse and torture for dissociation and programming um, because of this seemingly insane and I think inefficient need for compartmentalization in the programs and the compartmentalization is probably there mostly now for them to protect their asses, the main perpetrators running the show. Um, there's a common themes of the technology that's being done. I mean, you know, it's one thing for one person to come up with a, a 20 and back, you know, time travel, back to the future thing, but for multiple people to talk about 20 and back and then for them to start getting more and more detail with, with as more survivors come forth, speaking about doing multiple 20 and backs and the technology behind that combined with the mind wiping, combined with, um, parallel universes, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I it, 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 it's, it's a lot to wrap my head around, yeah. What's 20 and back? So that's where they can take you for 20 years, so literally they can kidnap you um, and after 20 years they can take your consciousness and then transfer it back to the point where they kidnapped you. And by doing that, you basically get to be their slave for 20 years and then come back none the wiser for it. And then they can kidnap you again. So it's kind of like a Groundhog Day slash Back to the Future, um, you know, abduction scenario. Wow, feel the fucking cold air coming out. This is just like that battery system the whole before it's will be about. Except it was blowing out way. Oh shit. You gotta feel this air. Let me clear out the bunker. So this is battery 216, and this is the first place I ever ventured into the base through a hole in the wall right here. It was this hole about this size in this wall behind here, so big enough for us to fit through as kids. We didn't have any flashlights or anything, so we went straight through to the other side, uh, holding onto the walls for light, just to feel our way. And when we got to the other side, we had to make a decision to cross over a hole in the floor that went from one side of the wall to the other. So the only thing for us to step on was a little piece of rebar like this. And then as you get close to the other side of the hole, our friends would grab our jacket and pull us the other way. So when we got to the other side of the hole safely, we picked up like a piece of cinder block, like a chunk of concrete about this big and dropped it down the hole. And it went like one, two, th maybe three seconds and hit water. So it was like three stories, maybe four stories deep. And later on, I had found out from many people that they've been down there. On the blueprints, this bunker ends right here on this wall and goes all the way down. But if you look at the hill on the side of this bunker, there's plenty more of this hill. And what they described was going down staggered layers on the other side of this wall, down into that lower area. So most likely originally for World War II was like an ammo storage where they had an elevator to lift up shells. But later on, they tried to turn this into a Nike nuclear, nuclear missile base in 1965. So they were repurposing it for other things. The last thing I heard that they actually did here was the Navy SEALs and Navy, um, some kind of other Navy branch. We're, together, we're doing an exercise here in 1970 um, I don't know why the Navy was using army property, but the only thing I could think of is that something down there connects out to the beach. Now down on the beach, Danielle found some um, bluffs that were like cement instead of clay. They seem like fake bluffs. It's possible that this was an entrance to the beach on the beach level through this bunker down and onto the beach. And the thing that wraps it all, ties it all together, there was a windmill right here, a house by Lathrop Brown, who was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's best friend, Harvard roommate. And he was the chief of the Navy, the head of the Secretary of the Navy at that time. And they were, Franklin Delano Roosevelt would come right here and hang out with him when he got polio. He was recovering here. And who knows what those two cooked up. I mean, both heads of the Navy, they could have easily made something like this that goes out to the beach at the time. So that's my theory. All I know is that there's a deep underground here. This is the first place I was ever inside of it, Camp Hero. And it's also one of the most least well-known about bunkers on the base. As far as the underground tunnels at Montauk uh, in Montauk, Long Island, I, I don't, I have never heard whether uh, the uh, t 
tunnels are underground. Uh, but I mean, just according to rules of common sense, I, I would believe that they would have to be. It's open for a while. Yeah, there's a room under here. And there's a room in this building you could go underground. And this goes four stories underground. To have that level of activity hidden from the public in general, I mean, it would seem that it would have to be underground, uh, in underground labs, uh, especially when you're thinking about the volume of things that they were doing, uh, they were doing down there. I mean, they had down there a, a sort of, uh, a, what, what we would know today, like sort of like a Hadron Collider in order to create the time-space continuum disruption that they needed to connect with other dimensions. So that would have been an extremely large space that they would have needed. And at the same time, they also had facilities where they were keeping children and prisoners uh, and experimenting on them and their abilities. Uh, and that absolutely happened. Yeah, so good. Hey, yeah, can I run the flashlight over here for a sec? Oh, it's all filled with water. Oh, huh? shit, flooded. Yeah, so there's a basement right below this. Because I got a picture below those springs right there, looking up at those springs underwater. Mm -hmm. That's what I got a picture of right there. You see the big yellow spring? In my picture, I'm looking up from the bottom of that. Oh, shit. Pretty cool. But there's a way to get in right around the corner, behind the stairs. There's red grating. See, through that wall on the other side is where the red grates and the floor might go up to the, uh, might go up to the, okay, down to the basement, I mean. <laughs> I'm going to take a quick look. Yeah, let's take a peek. I guess I just ruined it. I got another light. I'm freaked out because of that one uh, thing we found in your, your video. Can I use one of them? What? Just the point. The oh, way. come on. That's cool. all I got. Yeah, yeah I kind of freaked out looking. Look at all oh, that. That's my bags. Oh, shit. Yep. This is exactly... This is the way in the fucking basement. All these years. I never fucking knew until I saw the pictures the other day. These are the red grates. I was just telling you there's a ladder that goes down into the lower floor from the real estate photo. I wonder if it's flooded on purpose. Yeah, it is. That's what they say. Can give me a What's quick shot up? Reflection? I don't know what you... Here. Here. Yep. These are photographs taken in the basement of a Sage Radar Tower, before the one in Camp Hero was intentionally flooded. As you can see, there is certainly a facility here, with a hole in the floor suggesting the structure may reach even further into the earth. Brian, tell me a little bit about the purported underground, your belief as to why it may be there, the way that people have talked about it, uh, some of the evidence that you've come across in respect to not only Utilidor Utilidor tunnels, but uh, you know, a deeper underground. What are your thoughts on this? What's your research led you to? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, I guess starting from the top, I wanted to rule out where known things are. So start with the topmost things like the sewer lines, which is not fun, but it, you know that there's something else not there. Then for other deeper structures like water and stuff, they, would, they couldn't be where the sewer lines are. They'd have to be elsewhere. So you put them, you know, they're obviously above or below. I started with the top layers of everything and then deeper, we have World War II structures that we know are the similar, they're built like cookie cutters. So California, San Francisco, I don't, can't say the exact place, but there's a video on YouTube and that's the exact same tunnel system. They built these things like, you know, templates by the template and by the hundreds. And so you'd go down a staircase in the back of the, you know, the 16 inch gun battery. You have two of those at Camp Hero and you go down a staircase, which is now you're 30 feet below ground. You go 500 feet through a tunnel, and then you climb a ladder that's 30 feet up onto a platform where there's another ladder. But keep in mind, now you're at ground level, but you're going up another 30 feet, and that's this, the radar hill that they built up on top of the regular ground level. They buried, and there was already a hill there. They did terraform it. I have proof of that too. I have topographical charts from different years. You can see the hill clearly changed before World War II. Anyway that tunnels there so we know that's like 30 feet deep then when they built utilidor tunnels for the rate air force took over that part right then they built their own powerhouse for the radar and all those massive amounts of power that they needed so there was a huge uh, four locomotive engine generators diesel generator uh, turbines in a huge powerhouse it it definitely went underground because a friend of mine uh, worked there filled in 
the uh, giant hatch that was the big, huge water main hatch. And it was flooded for many years. That was also in the documentary, in the bonus footage of a certain documentary. So long story short, that tunnel runs next to, from it runs down the whole road that they paved to it, underneath the road. And they found it on Sci-Fi Channel, uh, Lester Holt, with uh, GPR. It was ten, the ceiling was 10 feet below the surface there. This area, deep within the heart of Camp Piro, is known as the Planetary Grid Crosspoint, a name coined by Preston Nichols. In the Montauk Enigma, my first documentary on the Montauk Project, I relayed a remote viewing experience involving this particular location. What you're seeing now is what's referred to as the Planetary Grid Crosspoint. And this particular place is very charged with some type of energy. Whether a portal or a vortex or something artificial may have been installed on this area, the remnants of whatever it was are certainly detectable today. The Algonquin Indians, the indigenous tribe predominantly living in Montauk, also knew this area to be very magical and spiritual. Is this particular spot something that they were aware of as well? I wanted my entry into this particular area to be very natural. And as the cameras rolled, my microphone stopped working the second I entered the circle. And the camera itself is acting odd. This is not HD that you're looking at, although it's being recorded in HD, and the focus continues to move in and out, which it did for the rest of the night. Immediately it feels like I'm being pulled down. Not physically, I feel like my energy, my core essence is being pulled straight down. Now, one of the things that I have said on my show and other shows, I shared an experience wherein I decided to try to remote view this spot. And when I did, I was able to get myself under the ground and I kept going deeper and deeper. And at one point I looked down and in my focus came this uh, laboratory type setting. There were three or four different people there. There was at least one woman and I think two men in lab coats as odd as it sounds and as cliche as it sounds. Now, it wasn't enough that in this spot, wow, I'm starting to feel really weird right now. Hmm. It wasn't enough that I saw them. They happened to look up all in tandem at me. And when I, I saw their eyes looking back at mine or from where I was, you know, in this particular vision, I panicked because I felt like I connected. They saw me and I went right back up into this spot, right back into, you know, my normal consciousness. So... This was definitely used many times. And if it wasn't used directly by somebody being here, they were tapping the energy of this particular location, right where I'm sitting right now. I followed up with a second remote viewing session one year later, only to find the exact same room, this time without anyone present. All the lights had been extinguished as I attempted to feel within the area for any sign of life, but could detect nothing but an eerie stillness. I asked Jessica Jones, who remote views criminal cases for the FBI, to consider this target, which she gave a full analysis of. I, I was tasked with a, a remote viewing target of the land, I guess it's the land, whatever's going on underground, um, where that circle was. So some of my data, okay, my, my sensory data, I was picking up on something uh, hard, metallic, long, very deep, tubular, cylindrical, red, brown, energetic, and melodic, okay? So I was hearing frequencies, sound frequencies, a lot of sounds. Uh, matter of fact, um, for my analytic overlay, which in remote viewing, uh, that's my rational brain, like, it's like my brain trying to rationalize uh, exactly what's what my sensory data is, like what I'm sensing. And so this is me like trying to make sense. So uh, I picked up on lead, minerals, metals, uh, a cavern, a tunnel, lead pipes, 
iodine, copper, copper wire, crystals, quartz. So I was picking up on like crystals and quartz, like big crystals. I'm not talking about like small crystals, like some kind of big crystal, uh, potentially like wrapped in wire. Okay. Um, I got that whatever this is, is a power station with an engine, uh, tubes, motors, generators, moder modulator. Um, I also picked up on ley lines and a power source of some sort and a power grid uh, with a lot of sound frequencies and I wrote down cymatics, okay? And I believe that's, um, it, it's sound frequency and, uh, and I, it can be used for, for healing and things like that, but I picked up on cymatics, okay? Um, I was, uh, something was super no noisy and I was picking up on a lot of tones, like I said, and I was picking up on waves, um, but Okay, so this is some of the analytic overlay that I wrote down. Sound bath, sound frequency, music tone, sound hub, ancient ways, microwave scalar energy, something that was going up and down and all around. And then I picked up on time riff through time and space is what I heard. Like I, I clear audiently heard that through time and space and space like continuum. Okay, so um, this, this was some sort of uh, there's some sort of generator down there, and I mean, it, it, there could be anything down there. I do believe that there are, there's a lot of activity to this day going on underground right there, and um, there's probably, it's probably super active. They're potentially doing time traveling things there, and if it's not today, it was in the past. And knowing what I know uh, of what went on at Camp Hero, that's exactly what they were doing uh, back in the day, according to the people who were in those projects. You know, when we think about the Montauk Project and we understand that there's a non-linear aspect about it, it sort of puts a certain perspective on the people that are coming out now. You know, a young man like yourself saying, you know, I was involved in this one way or another. Um, when I've talked to people about this in the past and my own research brought me to the idea that there are sister projects that occurred after Montauk the way that we know it. Maybe it never actually, you know, shut down, but, you know, these sisters' projects went into the 90s and so forth. How was it, in your experience, that you are the age you are, and you, what were you being sent back to Montauk to work within that realm, or how did that unfold? Okay, so how it worked at Montauk was it would take you between the ages of six and eight and they would mind fracture you on that you know the dunking you in the water raping you torturing you making you kill animals they mind fractured you and after they did that and they had you programmed and they had your altars set up then they would send you back home and they and then they'd pick you up when you're around 15 or 16 and um they do that because it's like, okay, a kid, a child is useless as a soldier but they had to program them so they program the child and then when they're old enough to like actually start training for combat like 15 16 that's when they take them and um so for them it, at montauk you know you, you get this kid and they're six years old you send them through the portal and five minutes later you got them at 15 16 years old so this is like it, the, literally because you have to think about that at montauk there's no such thing as time like people like say to me like people have been like you weren't born until 1991 and montauk happened before then it's like dude time travel so you said that you spent what, 30, 33 years, something like that, in Montauk? Did I, did I hear that correctly, or was that something? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it was all in Brookhaven. I, I couldn't tell you that, sorry. So, but I do remember being in a cage, and they would, we were naked, and they would, uh, it was cold, and they would spray us down with water and, as if we were not cold enough. Um, that would have been the early part, but eventually they, they allowed us to be in the barracks. Do you remember that holding cell, sort of, I mean, you know, when they went into, uh, you know, Al, Duncan, and Cameron, when they went into Camp Hero for that now legendary video of the walk around, you know, they identify you know, chicken coop areas. It kind of looks like they, you know, maybe kids were held there. Do you remember anything like that where, you know, they stacked slats of beds and so forth? Or do you have a different memory of that space? Uh, well, I have a memory of another facility on, a, on another location where I was at. But uh, yeah, all the kids in there were, were psychically linked to each other. So if one of them got tortured, the rest of them felt it. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that was um, another um, um, facility. I think that's connected with Umbrella. But um, yeah, that's all I can tell you about that. Yeah. 
Is there anything else? That well, they would give it. They put a dog bowl in there and gave us some food sometimes. And then later on, we would have this paper bag with a sandwich in there and a little pill, red pill we were supposed to take, and that would help wipe our memories. I think um, Tony Rodriguez was talking about the pill that they gave him, but he was allergic to it. So I think that's why he partly got his memories back because he wasn't able to take the drugs that they want him that we that I was they put us on, and I don't know what it, what it was. It's red looks what tastes like cinnamon. Were your folks or your family part of any sort of military factions, and wherein this became an easier pursuit in one way or shape or form? Yes, Air Force intelligence. Uh, satanic cults, Freemasons, um, are all intertwined and all very present on both sides of my family. Um, the Air Force was more on my biological father's side and the satanic and Luciferian cult content <laughs> was more on the side of my mother. Um, but these groups work together very closely, especially recently and especially on projects such as Montauk. Um, you know, historically there's been a little bit more separation between the sort of more clinical or science-based approach to mind control and the more religious or kind of you know faith-based approach to mind control but um, as you know following the the split in our larger society between science-led you know beliefs and spirituality-led beliefs um, but recently and this is why part of why the dark forces have become so powerful is because they in advance of the rest of us, um, have embraced this union of science and spirit, and they're really working both sides. Um, and organizationally, that's mostly the Satanists and Luciferians and Air Force Intelligence and the CIA working together very closely. Yeah. Can you tell me why ritual and satanic worship and whatever Luciferian concept was so important to people who were running Montauk? Well, people are not naturally inclined to cause harm, so you have to give them some limiting belief system so that they cause harm. <laughs> that's the most, maybe that's a little boring, but that's the basic kind of reason. Yeah. I like that. It's succinct. You yeah. Know, that we have to go around in, in different factions to come back to a certain point, because maybe it is that simple. I think a lot of people feel that there's more of a complex nature to the human nature that we're you know, familiar with, but at the same time, we're very simple creatures, you know, yeah. and you can see this in certain actions observed, you know, in many ways. Yeah. Do you feel that you'll always be working with these experiences that you had within the Montauk Project for your entire life? Do you think that there will come a point possibly where you can say, you know what, I'm done, I've let this go, I don't need to revisit this unless I'm, you know, attempting to work with somebody else who's going through the trauma and, you know, as a reflection, you can be there. Do you think there will be an end point for you where it just, it doesn't matter any longer? Definitely by 38, 33. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but that's obviously beyond this lifetime, most likely. Um, within this lifetime, I think so, yes. Um, I mean, it gets lighter every year, and with every person that I help to heal, it gets lighter for me too. So I'm also helping myself with this process. You know, every time it just gets, just gets a little more transparent, like you know, a little more clear, and it just moves easier. So I feel that happening within myself. I expect it to continue. What you have with the Montauk Project, you have an effort by the secret government or whoever to act as an interlocutor between heaven and earth. Although it's it's much more of an uh, interlocutor of earth and hell. So, mm -hmm. so and, and Duncan and Preston went deeply into the domains of heaven and hell. Uh, not so much in a religious sense, but not it wasn't irreligious either. It was mm -hmm. in a esoteric sense that they would contact different domains uh, that would come through in the experience. So uh, the souls of Montauk are, uh, and, and of course, every, every, all the devastation that was done out there is sort of on top of those souls. It's like comparing 
uh, the saints of Christianity to all the people that died in the Crusades. On the first trip taken to Camp Piro, Mike Colantonio happened to spot an old audio reel emerging from under the brush, partially buried and weathered. This was certainly not an object that should be exposed to the elements and an absolute anomaly why it was there at all. The reel was kept and preserved, and one year later, Brian Minnick would bring the reel to a recording studio some distance from his town. What was discovered upon playback was curious in and of itself. Keep in mind, magnetic audio tape quickly degrades when exposed, but somehow the reel found exhibited very little sign of deterioration. No, if anybody can bring it back, that's a reel to reel. Holy shit, Holy dude. Holy shit, Brian. This is like something you'd find out right now. Or yeah, you're right. Holy I say we God. take it. Yeah. Why not? Oh, Definitely, man. I'll send it to them. If anybody is Fuck yeah. Let's take a look at that thing, man. Yeah, that goes right up to the wall. It's a reel to reel. That's amazing. You never know, maybe something can be salvaged off of that, and that's just odd to find lying around on the topsoil. Wow. Amazing. Good. Oh my god. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Good eye. Decades before these reels. It is widely believed that music was utilized within the programming process and as a propellant into time travel endeavors. Where did this reel come from to be so well preserved? Was it accidentally dropped by some passing audiophile? Or had this object slipped through from another timeline? Both propositions may seem absurd, but it is obvious the reel must have an origin, even if we never know where that might be. A lot of our duties at Montauk were not necessarily military. Um, some of what we were used for was more cultural and spiritual and musical and artistic. So we were used for our creative capabilities. And specifically, we were used for writing a lot of the popular music that's come out over the last few generations in our culture. So that's a whole angle of Montauk that's barely been explored. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of Obviously, when you're talking about reptilians eating children and all this dramatic stuff, um, it tends to overshadow the more subtle things. Um, but equally important for the project and for the planet is to go into that cultural production aspect of things. You'll see the if you watch the peak number, it goes, it just shoots to like seven or eight, like almost instantly. I can't even catch it. Huh. That's just jumping everywhere, dude. Uh -huh. That's a standard magnetic. Oh. Yeah, I wonder. Holy shit. You can hear something in there, man. <laughs> Listen to this. You gotta hold it down a little bit. Oh, that's cool. 
That's and it matches cool if it matches this vibration, that'd be cool. That's an intriguing. But it helps to be aware. It certainly does. That's pretty interesting. I do hear some kind of thumping and bumping. Like it's not in a pattern. No, I learned a long time ago. New York can't feel what I feel. I'm not old. Interesting. We just did a lot of tests in one spot. Yeah, why would they hide um, basic structures that most buildings have on the blueprints and not tell us, you know, act like there aren't any normal structures like basements? or anything on the ground. Because actually, if you look at those, you know, unredacted secret blueprints that we have, it's basically because that's the infrastructure of the system that they have. It's not really a house, it's a bunker. So it just, it's disguised to look like a house. Like the ones we went in yesterday, the ones we just went in on this video, um, they're actually cement inside. It may look like a house on the outside, but they have escape, they have tunnels underneath and they have generators in the basement and they have, you know, a, uh, a tunnel that you can leave and also that breathes the generators to have to ventilate and they have uh, rung ladders in the house up to the roof so the point is that they all need a basement for many things just like heating you know a uh, normal house uh, actually this is like an extra powered house it has many things it's actually a bunker so it needs more than the average house you know you have to have things in your basement even if you have a crawl space or something you have heating things, elements under your house, breathing things. So it's just common sense, there's a basement. And you can see manholes all across the site. We have blueprints to show the, the water tunnels, which is where, you know, just the water reservoir takes the water and they flow through the tunnels. They also have storm sewers on the surface that many people have seen in the woods that are like channels and streams that have wood across them. That was the natural storm sewers, so they don't have those tunnels. But there's so many things underground and we, we just found, um, basements to buildings I've been in that I didn't know there were underground. Like so, we went into an Air Force barracks that I have been in many times. I did not know there was a basement, but we just looked in the window and it's a drop about 20 feet down. And I, you're looking in there, it's like a cavernous basement and the whole floor was just gone. And there you go, there's another basement. We looked in multiple holes and found underground rooms. Now there's rooms everywhere that I know about. There's underground MK uh, MK2 naval computer rooms. So each battery had one of those in front of it in a, a hatch You go down. It's like an old-fashioned computer on the wall a bunch of cable holes on the wall. It's nothing big There's um, ele electrical substations. We went in one that's in the bottom of a bunker You know, that's the one we went down into the basement But there's also other ones that are just a manhole that you go down. There's also water main hatches There's uh, utilidor hatches everywhere. There's sewer tunnel hatches everywhere and there's so basically they have electrical systems water systems the old world war ii stuff was mostly phone wire so that was all about phones everything they'd have to pick up and talk to people like in shadmore where we went you can see how far it is from the radar you can see the radar from the roof of the shadmore bay. state park situated a few miles west of camp hero in the shadmore plains was a satellite site of camp hero in world war ii and was the location of two auxiliary bunkers and an anti-aircraft gun nest there were also subsurface communication tunnels that housed the landline phone cables and ran all the way to Montauk Point. This was the main means of communication for targeting the shots, placing the shots, giving the orders to fire the shots, so these tunnels were very important and nothing would work without them. However, this site has a darker history. In 1898, this was one of the many locations of Camp Wickoff, a quarantine camp for the very first soldiers coming home from a foreign war, the Spanish-American War. And they were sick and dying, many with malaria, yellow fever, but most were dying from starvation due to poor supply lines and poor planning. There was a lot of death and sadness on this property long ago. So on my very first visit to this site, I was not able to get into the first bunker, but the easternmost bunker was open, but there happened to be people inside. I came all that way and I figured I would just let them know I was entering and check it out and then be on my way. When I started to climb in, I heard them singing. I could make out two males and two females, so I yelled out to them, but they did not hear me. Before I could climb in any further, I noticed the nature of their song. It had a dark undertone. Uh, it sounded either religious or ritualistic. Maybe it was the octaves they were hitting in their harmonies. It was musically well done, but you could tell they were practicing. And I heard some of the lyrics. Lo, it's just the eye of darkness evil. 
They didn't hear me, so I decided to nope out of there as I wasn't interested in anything they were getting into. The date was December 18th as well, which happens to be the pagan holiday Saturnalia. So that may be the case. Montauk is known to be a high energy location full of high strangeness. Not just Montauk Point, but the entire area. It turns out some of the Camp Hero maintenance workers were watching my channel and saw the video. They were so concerned about it that they went there the very next day to check for signs of animal remains, blood, or any signs of sacrifice. I watched them climb into the bunker on Facebook Live where I had just been the day before. When I asked one of them later if they had found anything, they told me they didn't find anything at all. It was very clean. In fact, it was too clean. It even smelled of bleach. I think they said it reeked of bleach which can't be a good sign in this kind of location. One of my subscribers had watched, uh, a subscriber and friend had watched the entire video in 25% speed and then sent me like two dozen screenshots of a very white, very round head with large black eyes that seemed to be peering out of the windows of the first bunker as I went by and even ducking down when I turned the camera towards it. And then it showed up in other locations as I walked towards the eastern bunker. I was very happy not to have actually seen that when I was there. And I remained curious about this place until Dark Hour Paranormal, Michael, and myself were able to enter the building the following summer. Luckily, we were alone that day, and we were not able to climb in and check out the upper floors. And we did not see any signs of any previous activities. It just goes to show you, you never know what you might encounter when at Montauk. You know, we're all here because we're tied to Montauk in one way, shape, or form, namely to the Montauk Project. Out of, uh, you know, many people that I've met, you seem to be very deeply ingrained and affected by this particular project. Can you start me where things kind of went for you from the beginning of your recollection of being a part of this, you know, moving into that as an initiate? You know, what, what was your experience like? Um, so it started with I had an altar that kept on coming out. It would take over. And I guess it was like, it was just bizarre and, and really unsettling. I would say to myself, you need to remember who you are. You need to remember what happened to you. And uh, that went on for quite a long time and I was really freaked out by it. And then um, I had this dream that, uh, I, that like I was in this like, like a lecture hall and at the, it's like at the podium where the teacher would be, there was a military guy. And he was telling me about how I've learned how to use my abilities. And now I'm going to be transferred to learn how to use them in combat. And uh, I'm looking at his face in this dream and his face is blurred. You can't see his face. It's like the Matrix or something. Like it's just like, like a peach blur. Like they blurred out his face. And um, in the dream... I, I, like, it was like, obviously disconcerting. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And then I looked to my right and there's this little girl. So I was like, this whole lecture room. And, but I was still left over here and there's this little girl to the right. And that same thing, I couldn't see her face. I believe it was my trauma twin because she had black hair and I think it was her, but um, yeah, I couldn't see her face and it was blurred. And then I remember thinking, looking back at the military guy and like, in the dream, I was like, because I was like my child self in the dream, and I could feel that too. Then I was like, um, you know, fuck you for taking me from my home, you fucking piece of shit. Um, I wish I could use my powers to make your head explode. And then I woke up, and I was just like, what the f fuck was that, for lack of better? I mean, it was just like, that wasn't just a dream. Like I could tell it was like a recollection of some kind. So then I started doing a little bit of research. Um, I've always been into like the alien abduction stuff, but it was like the, I got this brick wall put up. I guess it was probably mind control programming where I wouldn't go past like the hybrid program. Like I knew a lot about that, but I wouldn't go past that. I was into Dr. David Jacobs, who's was pretty good at researching and did a, did a lot of work there. But I didn't understand like, okay, this is connected to the military until I had that dream. And then once I had that dream, it just, like, it opened that up for me. So I decided to look into it a little bit more, and I found Tony Rod Riggs. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure in his interview he talked about the blurred faces. And that just freaked me out. And that's when I connected 
the secret space programs to reality for me because for me it was something that I was I was unwilling to accept it because of the can of worms that would open up for me I think is what it was and so then I realized I kind of had to accept it so then I, I did a meditation and I was trying to figure out like okay well I kind of get the gist of what they do they kidnap people turn them into sex slaves send them off into space yada 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 but like what happened to me right so I started looking into it and trying to dig through my memories and figure out like where did it start for me like how, like you know um and like what happened to me and um so I, I did a meditation i lied down and i meditated really deeply on basically like okay what is this where does it all come from where did it all start and i remembered the fact that when i was in elementary school in second grade i was in the talented and gifted program and then when i went to third grade i wasn't in it anymore and I remember asking the teacher, why am I not in the TAG program anymore? And she's like, I don't know. And then these other kids that were in the TAG program, and I, was, I remember being in it with them, and they were making fun of me because they're like, dude, you were never in the talented and gifted program. You weren't in the TAG program. Like, we were in it, and you weren't. And that was really confusing to me. I remember even going to my home to my mom and asking her why, like, telling her how confused I was, and, like, why would they, like, lie to me and say, like, they don't remember me? And of course I realized, no, yeah, I never was in Talented and Gifted program. They were taking me out of school to some sort of facility somewhere and doing experiments on me and torturing me and stuff. And once they activated my psychic abilities, it was go time. And my memories aren't like 100% clear on how I got brought to Montauk, but I do believe it was through the public school system. And um, another thing, yeah, that's, that's basically how I started finding out about Montauk, was just finding out about the secret space programs in general and the fact that I was taken out of school through the Talented and Gifted program. I didn't necessarily remember Montauk right away, but then I started researching. I found Joseph Powell, and Joseph Powell did some energy work on me. Well, he doesn't like it when you call it energy work. I don't know what I'm supposed to call it, but he did something to me where he... Um, he opened up some, some chakras in me or something like that, and I started getting memories back. Like, there are etheric blocks in me, I guess, where I couldn't remember what happened to me. Like, they're blocking my memories. And he helped me with getting memories back. And so, yeah, the, one of the <clears throat> memories that I first got back after he unblocked was the fact that when they did pull me out of school, I remember where they brought me, sort of. Like, a lot of it's blurry, but I remember that... Um, I was brought to some sort of underground facility. I was strapped to a table. The classic electrodes under your nails and strapped to your genitals, all that stuff, and you're naked. And uh, there was a TV in the next room. Um, it might have even been in the same room, regardless, I couldn't see it. That's basically the point. I just couldn't see the TV. And they told me that every time that the, you, I hear the beep, I gotta tell them what color it is. Because the TV was, it would go beep, blue, beep, orange, beep, purple, beep, yellow, you know? And basically, they, um, what they did was, they're like, you're gonna tell us what colors are on the, on the TV. I'm like, I can't do it. I'm like, well, how am I supposed to do that? I can't see it. And they said, we know, the guy in the brown suit, I call him the man in the brown suit, I don't know who he was, but he said, we know what you are, you fucking monster. Like, you can do this. Like, you're gonna do it. And I remember this guy would like put out cigarettes and stuff on me, and he was really mean to me. He seemed to have a genuine hatred for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, eventually got to the point where, like, they'd shock me. So, like, if I guessed wrong the color, they would shock me. And it got to the point where I would guess right. Like, it'd go beep, and I'd say yellow, and I'd be right. Beep, orange, beep. And I was like, I could see it without having to see it. I could remote view it. To your understanding or recollection, do you remember anything outside of the Montauk Project creating super soldier uh, type events or people or did it originate in Montauk? Well, there was a mission I did for Kruger. I was sent back in time to uh, take out uh, Jan um, uh, Heather Shaw. So Heather Shaw is uh, the head of Shaw House and uh, Shaw House is a um, an underground facility underneath the city of London. They're pretty much responsible for human trafficking and pretty much everything wrong with this planet. And um, um, she, her um, her, she also goes by the name of the Sumerian goddess of the underworld, Arishagal. So I was, I did take her out, I, meaning I killed her, but um, she didn't stay dead. And um, she had her sister, Janet Shaw, recruit me into Montauk. Janet Shaw, um, her clone in this reality is the uh, um, pop star uh, Taylor Swift. 
and um, Heather Shaw in this reality is the uh, actress Vanessa Kirby. So um, yeah, uh, so I think uh, I might have actually been the super soldier first before I got recruited into it. Time travel was making all this thing a little blurry. Um, according to Peter the Insider, I spent about 30 year, 33 years at Montauk um, in that uh, particular project. But um, I don't know if it was all exactly in the Camp Hero era, area on, in a pocket reality or Brookhaven. But um, uh, we have Chassie over here next to me, and we were actually doing some research on the uh, Montauk 2.0 project. Now we can, we'll go on to that. If you want, to, I can go into history of that. But um, Chassie will help explain a little bit more about that in a bit. But um, so where would you like me to take this conversation? Do you want me to explain a little bit more about how my understanding of how the projects were divided up? Sure. Okay. Okay, sure. So we have the umbrella program of Project Phoenix. Now, some of this information, you can go, go back and listen to the original Al Balik material, but um, there were some group of paperclip scientists, Nazi scientists, that were conducting mind control experiments in Brookhaven Labs. This goes back to, this will be uh, right after World War II. So uh, uh, some of these experiments um, got into the hands of um, certain senators, and they became very nervous and scared of what their uh, research was uncovering on mind control. So they decided the, uh, the project was shut down and these uh, paperclip scientists were um, look, scouting for a new location and they just found the, uh, the uh, army base and uh, Camp Hero uh, was uh, about to be decommissioned. And uh, so that was decommissioned in 68, so 69, it was started to be set. So really about 71 or so, the so-called Montauk pro program began. But it, was, it is my belief it was in a pocket reality where they stopped time. Yeah, so on all, all the umbrellas under Project Phoenix is, you know, we got Project Pegasus, which was the looking, uh, that was with the Chronovisor technology where they eventually figured out how to use it to go back in time. In 1979, um, there was a group of, um, let's say, private corporations that were interested in getting away from the uh, military oversight because uh, a camp hero because that was a military program um so uh um so and also they're not there's more freedom to share information between other scientists in a more uh corporate setting so um a stargate or basically a sun disk sun disk was located somewhere in the amazon that uh, was brought over to Brookhaven, and um, they were the scientists were trying to get it to turn on, and ultimately um, they found that it required a blood sacrifice. So thousands of children were being kidnapped and transferred to brought it over to Brookhaven and murdered uh, to activate the star, the sun disk, and a acorn like device would um, pop through a portal and go th wherever in time they wanted they wanted to bring the sun disk to. So one of the things they did is they went back in time to the 1860s when it was last time, I guess, when it was still active to get more intel on other technologies. And also they found out that it was um, designed by certain reptilians like Quetzalcoatl. Um, so um, yeah, that might explain what some of the Mayans were, why they were committing so many blood sacrifices was to activate this technology given to them by some of these, in my opinion, really negative reptilians. So. Um, some of the children from Montauk 1.0 over Camp Hero were, were uh, they wanted to bring them over to um, to try to activate the sun disk without a blood sacrifice, and uh, so that's where it is my belief that I'm over there right now, a different clone body, and also uh, Chastity uh, remembers being over there as well. How can you tell the difference when it comes to Montauk and the experiences of the Secret Space Program? How can you tell the difference between? A past life that you're living, and again, I understand that time's not linear. So, just you know, for the sake of conversation, yeah. how would you differentiate an experience that you had in another body, in another time, in another experience altogether, versus something that happened to you in this time period within this body, and so forth? Again, yeah. in way of memory. Yeah, yeah, that's a delicate one. Um, generally, the experiences that are of this body like in what, on whatever timeline, in whatever form, like if it's the same physical body, which for most of us it is, um, the memories are gonna be much more, uh, much more palpable, much more in the body, in the present body. Um, for those of us who do past life work, there's usually a, a sense of separation. That was that body, this is this body. And so, you know, there may, there may be things that cross over from life to life, you know, very, the most common one I usually hear is like, 
oh, I was killed in such and such a way and my death wound has carried over to my new body and now I'm working with it here, right? So that's, that's a very common one, like, and I'm gesturing because, you know, I've, I've gone through that. I've been killed in various wars in the past. Most of us have. Um, but um, in, when, it's, when it's in the present body, um, it's much more immediate and it's more, it's more like working with childhood trauma. Um, I mean, it is childhood trauma most of the time, but you're not always in a child body. <laughs> but, <laughs> but generally your state of mind is gonna be of a young child. Like, even if you're, you know, appearing adult to the outside world and you're functioning as a super soldier, like internally on a very deep level, you're probably gonna be a small child. And so those memories tend to come back from a child's perspective with a child's emotions, you know, very wild. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, considering the developmental uh, arena of mm -hmm. you know a child's mind at that time. Yeah. And what was done, obviously or purportedly, you know, as we find, uh, and of course the memories they, they flood back. Mm -hmm. and those are all corroboration against each other, mm -hmm. which you know in many cases these people don't. You know, we don't know each other from a whole in the long that we meet each other over this experience, and we realize that they, there are consistencies. And yeah. That's you know the scary thing because now you know. There's something grounded in reality, and it's becoming real for you in this time. Oh yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. Like when we survivors meet each other, it's we're like it's constantly like oh, I remember you from this. I remember you from that. And like I don't remember myself there, but uh, okay, you know that's usually the first phase, <laughs> and then gradually acceptance comes, and then gradually it's like oh right, I remember you too. Ah, oh, and it's usually you know it's underneath all this pain. So it takes a while to, to open that up and get there. I didn't really know anything about any of this until May when I met him at a conference. <laughs> when I met James at the conference and I was just like, wow, okay. I, I had been avoiding it. I had like perpetually been avoiding it, running as far away as I could. I just wanted to do the spiritual work and and be a good person. And I had already been through enough in this life. I didn't want to go and make any more waves. I just wanted some peace. And when I met him at the conference and he was telling me his story, I started having pieces come back to me. Um, memories that I remember in this life that triggered me and I didn't know why because I didn't want to see and then I just couldn't ignore it anymore he was like James said you got to tell your story it'll help in regards to the Montauk project through all the evidence that you gathered, through all the research that you've done for the years that you've been doing this, what is your official thought on the existence of that project, the way that it's been described by Preston Nichols uh, as you know, the first whistleblower, and of course many others who claim to be part of that project that have come out of the woodwork? What is your overall thought about the uh, happenings that might have been at Montauk? Oh, well, I've gone like this, if I've gone back and forth so many times on since the very beginning, you know. I, I started off suspect and I then when we watched we got those tickets to see like a public speaking event and got to meet you know sit right there in front of them and listen to them and then talk to them at the end of those and uh, introduce ourselves we began to really see some of the things that they were coming up with were very real uh, things that were dug into like just little facts and things that I was able to verify basically some of the things were local like local knowledge and um, I checked around with people and some of the things checked out like it sounds very vague but here's an example somebody i know very well um who worked at a missile base not a radar base but he went for he was in the army he went for r and r in the 70s like 73 74 at camp hero and he was in um, the army but is an air force base but they would have other groups and brigades and different service people i don't know how who they had or what but they had different people in rotation to have r and r they called it relaxation and rest or rest and relaxation anyway he told me he's like yeah i went there twice for it and i'm like oh well what did you do he's like nothing we just sat around and ate like picnicking and um i said was the radar turning and he's like yeah the radar was turning we were just hanging out 
and, th and that was it. And then he said, I went there twice, actually. So there you go. That's something Preston and Peter Moon wrote about in the book. And when he told me, he doesn't mess around. He doesn't believe in, he won't say any of this stuff is real. So this is a guy who absolutely would not be uh, agreeing with any of this. And here he is telling me he went to the r, &R. That's just one small sample of like, so I went back and forth with the trust with them. And um, there's times when I trusted what they said, but then when I saw some things, I started questioning, of course, with the kids, you know, the stories with what they did. I mean, almost admitting some stuff and like, I already didn't get a good vibe off one person there. Um, Yeah, because what, uh, what I wanted to say is I've gone back and forth with, with trusting them. And I do think there's a, a, a grain of truth in all legends. And I do think also that may, some things may have been embellished. It has crossed my mind before. Uh, is this like something they wrote to make somebody look the other way or to make the story seem so unbelievable that it can't be true? But I really, in the end, I think they were... I think Peter Moon found them and was trying to get to the bottom of it and help them get it out there in books. I think Preston is a man who definitely believes it. I know a family member of his who's a friend of um, my wife's friend, basically. And she is uh, a family member and known Preston his whole life. And we asked her, you know, did he ever work there? And she said, yeah, as far as I know and my family knows, yes, he did. And, and we were always aware of it. And um, she actually gave me a book uh, signed by Preston's mother, Jeannie Nichols, to, uh, to, I think she just wrote her name in her own book. And, and it ended up in her hands. Um, and then she, her husband didn't want it in the house because it had really crazy art. And I said, this is awesome, I'll take it, you know. And then turns out, so I have this book signed by Preston and Peter Moon. Uh, they signed it to a judge. That judge's grandson lent me my first copy of the Montauk Project, and he never took it back. I never gave it back. But long story short, I have the book. Then they wrote about that book in the second book, saying that they signed a book for the judge who, who uh, presided over the court trial where they were arrested at the base. And I'm like, I'm reading this book, and I have the book they're talking about right here, you know? So I had a long, like, back and forth with thinking about them and what they've said, and I really appreciate the books and what they did, because it kind of gave me my style of, con well, Peter Moon, in a sense, of connecting far across points and try to find similarities and things at least like that and some of it's from like just things like whatever logic or detective shows or something I picked up but the point of trying to map all these things that are not like not interesting like sewer tunnels it's just just to find out where the interesting stuff is that's what I really want to do and to do that you have to be thorough you have to rule out and if you believe something's there and you find evidence there's otherwise you have to let it go and and say you were wrong and move on to something that's and that's what i'm doing i'm constantly changing it but there's things that aren't changing that are like solid now i found like facts that are like rock solid so i'm going to plot those things in as definites and i'm going to have things that are maybes and probabilities and then i'll have things that i don't freaking know so this is just my guess and that's how i'm going to try to do my mapping of um the entire tunnel system. A cross, like a memory cross here. Right over here, brother. Is this this kind of thing I need to be on the It doesn't, it's up to you. I'm, I'm giving I'm you the go, option. I'm going to go get my tower. I want to gift it. I want to gift it. You got your smudge?
Titus as we release the captives. So overall, you know, what were we witnessing while you were all in the circle? I mean, we saw a lot of emotion. It began with you guys huddled together standing. Mm -hmm. And there were utterances that sounded similar to some sort of Native American language. It might have been speaking in tongues, which is okay because within the ritual it's about the intention, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet, there, I don't know, maybe there was some light language kind of mixed in there. Mm -hmm. but what, do you, what can you make of what was being expressed while you were in the circle yesterday with everyone? Yeah, it's a mixture of things. Um, sometimes it's pure sound just to get past the mind and to get into the emotional body. You know, sometimes it's that, speaking in tongues is one name for that. Um, other times it's uh, languages that are used by the Galactic Federation, like Syrian, especially white language. Um, in my case, there's a lot of Lemurian mixed in there. So, you know, Lemurian has language relationships to several different earth languages. Um, uh, especially places of the Lemurian diaspora like South America. So some of the sounds are going to be broadly similar um, to some Native American languages and some South American languages. How do you feel the ritual overall went yesterday? Do you feel that you cleared something? Um, do you think that things have been lifted? The way that I described it, just for example, when somebody asked me, you know, did they do it? Did they clear everything? I said, well, it was kind of like pulling the worm's head out of the ground. The rest of it's still kind of snaking through. Yeah. You got an initial root out. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I resonate with that metaphor. I think it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, um, we uh, blew the lid off of things. <laughs> um, and now it's, I mean, it's much more open for a lot of people to work with who are called to work with it. Um, I think we accomplished what we set out to do. I mean, that was basically the mission, right? We wanted to use, and I haven't even gone into that, but there, there's this big time wave that we're a part of. Um, and especially every 20 years, like, 2023, this year, 2003, 1983, 1963, these are all, and 83, these are all very pivotal years um, in the whole cycle of these energies. Um, and there, there are interlocking reasons for that having to do with just how the earth is moving and evolving. Um, but yeah, we just wanted, we wanted to use this portal um, to, to really bring this to light um, around the world and beyond. Um, to bring healing into our personal lives and into the lives of all people affected by these projects. So uh, I think in that goal, we were fabulously successful. <laughs> I mean, getting to see the Sage Radar and, and all that, I mean, it, it's interesting to be here, but I don't want it to be about being a, a tourist or a fanboy. Really, it's about being with the survivors and, 
and, and seeing their healing and, and watching them say, wait a second, I remember you, you were, you were there, you were that person who did X, Y, and, and then they're filling the details. And I'm watching this in front of me, okay? So as someone who's done a lot of advocacy and organizing and, and you know, my own armchair researching and organizing, and yeah. I, and this is happening in front of me. I know this, you're not, people aren't making this up on the fly, very detailed levels that corroborate with other survivors I've spoken with across the country and the world. So, uh, if I could, Angel, I'd like to hear your take on what yesterday was like for you. What yesterday was like? Yes, what was Well, it started, like? it started two and a half years ago when I, when I learned about the portal and started doing really serious research about it. And the, uh, anniversary of the Philadelphia experiment and I had visions of all this I knew we'd all get together and do all this stuff and my dream is to have us ascend to shut down the projects and to save the children because we've all been through hell and I would not wish this on any child and there was no way I could sit back and, and wait for somebody else to do it knowing that we're the ones who were meant to do that, and were powerful enough to do it, and doing it together was essential. Because the more of us we get together in one place, the more powerful we are. And I don't see the point in wasting billions of dollars of government money or whoever it was to train us to do all these magical things and just use it for them. Why not use it for good for a change? So that was my goal. I felt some grief from those who were lingering and watching. They were, they've been waiting for us to come in and do this so that they could be freed. And I felt the mixture of their emotions as they released so that they could let go. And I felt their transference of their energy um, to us in their letting go. And then I also, I felt like I was home. Yeah. Yeah. And I was excited to see everybody, my family my brothers and my sisters and and all the elementals and the Sasquatch <laughs> and I could feel them around us supporting us and so that made me really happy and I felt childlike again free to be me finally and I felt that our Joining together and allowing our ability to allow ourselves to be who we are, who we've become. And it gave us this unity that can't be broken. And, and we just started shifting all of the things that were done to us that weren't right. They weren't. They were just horrible. We were able to release the emotions that they caused us to feel, and we released those. And in doing that, we blew a hole <laughs> that swirled into a vortex that cleared the atmosphere around there. And it like rippled out in power and, and waves of energy from there. and and reset everything and when we opened our eyes I could see the matrix the grid the honeycomb um, and I just felt lighter freer and at peace finally I think yesterday also went well um, I didn't really know what to expect coming into this I was uh, fairly um, uninformed myself about what to do. I'm just following the, the voices in my head, essentially, just going with what I think is right. And uh, brought me here to New York, and uh, I met my 
friends, my team, my family here, and we uh, we uh, did yeah what Chastity said. We we did a lot of work and we accomplished an impossible feat. Um, but we did it together, and it took all of us. And there nobody really. We were just um, doing what we thought was, was the right thing to do, and it turned out we know what we're doing apparently. So. <laughs> We're not crazy after all, um, but no, it went really well. It was a hard, hard job, um, but everybody here was more than willing to risk everything they had to do it, and uh, we succeeded. And I hope um, we will see the the results of that work soon. Um, however, I think this is um, one very big step in a series of many steps that need to be taken to stop what's going on and then to start rectifying what has been done in the past. But that is a very long process that will need much care and attention. But this, yesterday was a very good day, a great day for, for humanity, a great day for this galaxy, and a great day for the universe. So thank you. I'm so glad we're all here. And I'm glad that this team was formed and that we all made it to do this impossible task that I was now done. Um, so I am a Montauk experiencer. Um, most of my memories are buried in a little pocket in my mind where I don't have to deal with them. I do have a few memories though. And um, I wanted to organize this trip so that people that were also ex experiencers could come along and uh, we could use this as an opportunity to transmute the trauma that we were put through. So um, over the past few days, we've been um, visiting Camp Hero where um, we've been uh, putting our hands on the walls and tuning in to the past, uh, like an echo, a quantum echo that still resonates in the area that um, for me anyway, unfortunately, I'm also tuning into another aspect of myself there, which is screaming to get out. But um, um, yeah, so we did a ceremony or, or right on the ley line in the barracks area in Camp Hero where um, we were tuning in to some of our aspects. And my, my particular experience is I saw myself in the future and I'm questioning why the heck am I here? Why the, really, why the hell am I here? Because I certainly, I didn't want to be here. I would, I signed up for it in a way I was kind of forced into it, but I think being sent back through time and being participant of these programs, I was at least, in my opinion, I helped transmute it. At least I am now. But um, yeah, so that's my experience. Yeah, um, for me, um, what I've been experiencing, what I experienced yesterday is just like reconnection um, to the truth. Uh, being here and seeing Camp Hero, seeing where I know flying saucers used to land, well, the landing pads are still right there, right out in the open. It's been no one, people walk past them every day and have no clue what they are. Like, it's just really mind blowing. And you need and to see all the entrances, um, you know, blocked off with cement and everything else. And it's my first time being here as a free person. So it's all about, for me, it's been about grounding grounding myself and reminding myself that this is you know all real and that i need to take it seriously and then the healing i, I, I liked what colin said before about um just the fact that like <laughs> we apparently know what we're doing because <laughs> like we they were talking in this you know like not dead language because we we're speaking it so i can't call it dead but um it's this weird language and I could understand them and 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 um just like and then like um during the ritual just you know I pulled some etheric implants out of James and I like I had no idea that I knew how to do that I just knew I had to do it so I did it and um yeah for me it's just been an experience of like grounding myself and and me and, and my what I am, my truth, because, you know, the thing about Montauk is, I think the saddest part about Montauk, uh, well, the Montauk Project, Project Phoenix, whatever you want to call it, is the fact that they took us from ourselves. 
Like they robbed us of ourselves. They shattered us into a million pieces and took us away from ourselves. So this is about like the very slow and arduous process of reassimilating all those pieces and becoming whole again. And I, I think one of the most, like this was hugely important to come here. Like I didn't even realize how important it was this I was here because it is transmutation. Um, a lot of people ask me like, what's, you know, what have you noticed about this trip? Like, what, and I've just noticed that it's, it's, it's not as dark as I thought it was going to be. And it's because we are all here in a positive manner and we're all here for love and light and, you know, all the good things. And then you got to keep in mind, like all these people that come to this town on vacation with their families and stuff like that, like they have good energy. They're bringing good energy here and they're just having picnics with their families, enjoying the beach. It's a place that where there's a lot of, of like good energy actually despite the fact that all the bad things happened here and it's not a negative ley line it's just a ley line and it can be used for good or evil and i think we literally healed that ley line yesterday we literally healed it because it was out of tune and it was messed up so we just we even though we kind of we just kind of knew what we had to do and we just went in and did it and we healed that ley line i uh been coming out here for a couple of years uh with um, Dark Hour Paranormal Michael and uh, Brian Minnick from Montauk is Strange. And, um, you know, we've, we've come and been trying to figure things out, I guess, right? And uh, working our way around, documenting things. Uh, you know, I, I guess there, it, it was somewhat of a, maybe we didn't realize it, it was gonna come here, but we knew it was gonna come here. Some, it, it was just preparation. It was almost preparation, if you will. And uh, you guys all came out here, and we linked up. And I'm learning a lot about this. Um, I didn't know much about it at all. And um, the ritual is really beautiful. I I'm really happy that that ceremony took place and the amount of respect that was there. Um, you mentioned the elementals and the Sasquatch. I, I, saw, I saw them and felt them as well. They were there with us. And, and that was what I wanted to try to ex bring to the table is to bring that element of their approval and their help and their, you know, um, them to understand that we were there <clears throat> for, for good and for healing. And we, you know, we weren't, the bad humans that they may have seen in the past. Um, one thing I'd like to touch on, I guess, is the energy inside the circle where you where you all were um, was very was very strong, and I was very reluctant. I, I was doing like a little two step, right, where I was kind of reluctant to go in, and uh, I kept kind of coming back out and going back in, and uh, at some point, um, I believe Angel cued cued me like in my in my mind like I, so i looked at her and then she called me over into the middle where you all were and uh something interesting happened uh, we were all connected through our hands in one way or another and uh i had my eyes closed and at one point i, I suppose if i had to label it maybe there was some sort of transformation going on um but i visually saw it and um i've seen these you know, all of us, I've seen you guys for a couple of days now up to that point. But when I opened my eyes, you were different. You were um, soldiers, if you will, um, of, of <laughs> like space. Um, you were dressed in like, you weren't dressed in like the battle rattle that some of them were. You were in like a, what I would call like a class A uniform of some sort, you know, like a, it, was, it was a lot to take in, you know what I mean? Um, it was a lot to take in. It was, it was, I didn't really know what to expect. It was, uh, I mean, I didn't really know what to make of it. Uh, it just happened. I ex just, I tried to refocus, gain focus again and connect and, uh, and we continued to heal. And then we did some work on James uh, a little later and, uh, you know, uh, it, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, what I was doing was Reiki. I don't, I'm not, you know, I, I just, I think it was a really healing and beautiful thing. I'm, I'm glad you guys uh, let me be a part of it. And, um, you know, I'm proud of you. 
All of you. Very proud of you. The survivors of traumatic events will always seek to heal themselves through whatever modality or introspection is appropriate. The survivors of the Montauk Project are no different and continue to seek solace and quietude from within. For those who may disagree that a project like the one described at Camp Hero could exist, recall there were hearings held on MK Ultra, a black project that explored mind control and manipulation, programming, and psychic activity. Do you have any follow side effects and since yes. the test took place, and what, uh, what have they been? Well, quite a bit, because I had to quit school. Uh, I was hospitalized when I uh, had the LSD experience, but that wasn't the end of it. I had to go through six and a half months of uh, psychotherapy. I was referred to a psychiatrist the next week. In 1953, my father, Harold Blower, died. At the time, his family was told that he died after receiving an overdose of a drug being given to him for diagnostic and or therapeutic purposes. Now, the Department of Army has informed me that my father was a victim of a drug test program administered by the New York State Psychiatric Institute under an Army contract. Not only is there no record of permission from my father to administer experimental drugs, but they were apparently forced upon him. I quote from the record, first day, first injection, first comment, very apprehensive considerable persuasion required. Anyone who's been around mental institutions can tell you that means my father was tied or held down. And prior to the third injection, my father pleaded, why do you do this? Well, are, we, are we talking about psychotropic drugs or psychomimetic drugs? All right. A any, any, kind of, uh, any kind of drugs that are used in any behavioral um, uh, research? Describable of where I have contemplated uh, taking my own life. Did you ever have those prior to the time that you took this, uh, this, this drug or? No, sir, I can honestly state I had never had any experiences such as this. He came out and spent, I think, three days with me in a, in a kind of a resort hotel on Long Island for Christmas. Well, sir, so naive to believe that uh, we're going to be able to, with the passage of any kind of legislation, uh, uh, eliminate uh, the the ills of our of a society, but what we can do is, to the best extent that, as legislators, that we are able to do is to set up the kinds of protections for uh, our citizens, which uh, I think, as all of this panel would understand, uh, all of us here, and I think I uh, speak without exception for the members of the Senate and Congress, uh, feel that every American is entitled to. It's been a particularly revealing morning of testimony. I think the chairman is to be thanked for having taken the lead leadership in scheduling this hearing and bringing this uh, whole question to the kind of focus that it has come today. The awareness of MK Ultra came about by those who would survive such ordeals and the families of those who would not. We shall not focus on the trauma of the events that unfolded, only to recapitulate those experiences and wash ourselves clean through the process of healing that works best for each individual. In the very near future, we will undoubtedly see more people coming forward, claiming to be a part of some endeavor they never consented to be a participant in. As the memories return, we will be able to slowly piece together those who are involved, perpetrators and victims. And perhaps within that recollection, we will remember how to restore the balance within ourselves and come to an understanding that our time in such projects was only one facet of the greater whole, the larger picture of who we truly are. Uh, we know just in the intelligence community, just from rumors from one intelligence agency to another, which is one of the ways that intelligence people use to stay alive, basically, is by listening to each other's rumors about what supposedly is going on and at the same time whoever's giving the rumors can't be charged with uh, giving off any giving out any secrets at all uh, so we would do that on a regular basis and Montauk uh, Montauk experiments were something that I heard about very commonly and I heard about what was going on with them and who all was involved with them and it just really seemed like massive massive projects that were going on there and it definitely would have to be done in underground labs.